Hey everybody, I hope you and your loved ones are safe, happy and healthy. Before you listen to or watch the show, remember to subscribe and follow the Mortgage Broker Club on Facebook and LinkedIn to stay up to date with all the latest news and updates. Please note we are not a mortgage broker and do not lend money directly to clients. Remember a mortgage and or borrowing secured against your home or property can be repossessed if you do not keep up the mortgage repayments. The content of this show is for information purposes only and is not to be relied upon. Stay well and I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Sean Rogers, and I am delighted to be joined by Jamie Pritchard, the Director of Sales at Glenhawk. Glenhawk provides short-term property finance with a strong capital base to lend, whether you're looking to acquire a new property or perhaps unlock equity in a current property or initiate in a property investment or refurbishment, amongst many other things. On today's show, we're going to be picking Jamie's brains on permitted development rights and in particular the changes that were brought into force on the 1st August 2021. Jamie, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, Sean. You okay? Good. We're good, thanks. Um, so this is part two in our special. If you missed part one, please check it out. It's brilliant on short-term property finance and bridging. Um, today, um, you may or may not know that on 30th March 2021, um, and forgive me now for all of the statute that is about to come out of my mouth, but the Town and Country Planning um, General Permitted Development Amendment Order 2021 was made. This inserts Class MA, which is Commercial Business and Service Uses to Dwelling Houses, into Part 3, Change of Use, Schedule 2, that easy this, isn't it, of the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development England Order 2015. The new permitted development rights will come into force from the 1st August 2021. Jamie, one of the more difficult questions I'm probably going to ask you, but can you help us put that into layman's terms and explain how permitted development rights have changed over the past few years? Yeah, actually, first of all, I think you just reminded me why I never became a lawyer because, yeah, you know, all those all those terms, it just doesn't make sense. So that's why we've got a compliance department that helps you out with those legal contracts. So um, what is permitted development, you know, and all that? Well, permitted development uh, rights are an automatic grant of planning permission. So this allows you, again, in layman's terms, to um, do certain building works and change the use of carried out to, without needing to make any sort of planning applications as well. So it allows you to do quite a few different things, but in a more, which I'm going to go to in a moment, uh, more timely. However, um, what permitted development for me, one of the major bits to really think of when you're looking at it, to break it down for a layman like myself, is that it's a factual objective thing. So it's factually there. You know what you can do and you know what you can build within actually the laws, as long as you understand those laws. We'll go into some of them without being lawyer on them in a bit, you know. But it's not at the whim of the planners at the council. So when you have to go for planning permission, it can take a long time and actually it is at the whim of whether the councillors are happy with that in each local authority. So time frame is one of the biggest factors at play with permitted developments. You know, developers incur huge delays sometimes and costs would go into the, pla um, to the plans departments. And I've actually heard of some examples where they've spent a long time. And this comes down to the knowledge of the developer, uh, not um, saying anything about the planning teams here. But they've actually gone for planning permission, it's been refused. And then actually after they read the document, they realised they could actually do it under permitted development rights itself. So permitted developments, as long as you're up to date with all the facts and the current laws, then you can proceed without any sort of delays in there. Um, you, you know, before I explain the rules, let's go back in time, as they say, you know, and let's go back to the beginning, as they say, right back to 2015, when PD, as we know, first came in um, through a very extensive document, which sounds a lot like what you were saying there, Sean, you know, but over countless pages. But that document, as I said, is long and it's been updated every year since. So it's really good to have a hand on that document and read it through. And, and like I said in part one of this um, uh, this 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 video that you'll be listening to or watching, that it's really good to have that crack team around you. So I can't read any sort of lawyer papers, but getting somebody that's really good at understanding those rules would be really good. What those extensions have been since then, every year, has actually just been a maybe sometimes just an extension on the law itself, just to take it out. So something that could be ended in 2017, extended on. Um, 
really permitted developments is brought out for this one reason. It's because governments are trying to encourage extensions and new builds. So they're encouraging either people themselves or people that, you know, for the houses they live in or for investments to be able to do that without all the red tape that comes with it. So um, there's been, you know, extensions to prior approvals and, you know, there's some examples of that uh, for the prior approvals as being sort of the four metre rule that you can extend out two to eight metres. Yeah, there is certain rules when you get out to eight metres and extending the property under permitted developments, um, as long as you don't have any complaints from the neighbours. So make sure that you, um, you know, buy them a bottle of uh, something for Christmas and get on with your neighbours, especially if you're looking to extend that property. However, um, permitted developments just doesn't mean that it's an open book that you can just change your property into anything, you know, when we're going back through this timeline. And there are a few tests that need to be done in there. I'll pick out a few for them. So you always need to know that you have to think about the flooding angle. So when you're building or extending or doing something, is there going to be a flooding concern with that? Also, is there going to be a surcharge of, uh, you know, of sewage and the sewage system itself? Horrible subject, but it needs to be considered. If you're converting, which will be going into a uh, office block that was worked into, then, you know, you're probably only having a few cups of teas. You're not living in that block. If you're actually, um, you know, turning that into flats, a different sewage system is needed. So considerations for that. One of the final ones I will give you is around noise. And that doesn't actually mean the noise from the block that you'll be developing under permitted developments, is actually if you were developing something maybe in the city centre that's near a nightclub or maybe a pub, for example, everyone loves a pub, we don't want to see the pub being in detriment because then the flats make complaints because, you know, they live next to a pub. The pub was there first. So those noise concerns need to be really factored in when we're seeing it. Let's fast right forward to last year. I'm sure everyone's trying to forget uh, 2020, you know, because of, the pandemic. However, there were some really good things that happened with permitted developments. And one of the major changes that happened, other than the one that we're going to be focusing in on, was September the 1st. And that saw um, a change of permitted developments within this new use class, which is E. And what new class business use classes are, or sorry, use classes and asset classes are, easy for me to say as you've seen, is that um, you really need to be know what these are when you're a developer and you may be changing one property from one class to another. Class E allowed you to benefit and change stuff that remained in there. So shops, offices, light industrial, medical services, you know, and no planning or prior approval was needed. So that the benefit of that, again, and for developers, is that those empty units could be utilised and changed into something. I'll go dramatic now and say, you know, there's no ghost towns anymore then. You know, they don't want the ghost towns bring crime with them and that ability to utilise sort of empty units. Now, people may be used to permitted development through um, um, from back in the past or when it started through if they were in development and trying to change a property that was residential into a HMO. And in most areas, you were able to change a property from a C3 class to a C4 class. That's the C3 into C4, which is HMO. However, in some areas, the council's bit back and there's an Article 4. We'll go into Article 4, I'm sure, with some questions later. So I'll explain what that Article 4 order is. But let's get on to the case in point and that uh, phrase that you put out there and trying to bring break that into layman's terms. Hopefully, we've got a bit more of an understanding of what PD can do for you there. But 1st of August, which they announced in March, allowed and come in the sort of evolution of what was there was Class M. Okay. Let's break that down. There's a new class, which is MA. Still not helping the audience of mine with all these different words. But basically, it gives you an opportunity to transform vacant commercial into residential. That's good enough for me you know, to understand myself. So that's not those C3 and then into HMOs. So this is actually C3, your residential property that you live in or you would rent. So buy to let or your regulated you know, residential property. So class E to residential is where it would be going, yeah? And that's what MA is. Some of the things it's brought about in that is that actually it um, allows you to convert maybe that office block if up to now 1,500 square metres that you can change that property and increase. Now, that is a massive increase on the previous allowance. It's a tenfold increase on the personal allowance. And that's brought on to probably help the high streets. We've seen... Um, for COVID, and we'll go into this several times, I'm sure, but it's not just COVID that caused the sort of demise of some of the high streets and some businesses. 
the writing was on the wall with some of these businesses with what was happening actually through the internet. I'm sure lots of people have had an Amazon delivery in the last 10 minutes. But, um, you know, one of the facts that you need to know is that you can't just buy that Debenhams if it just closed down yesterday. It has to have been vacant for three months. So whoever that commercial entity was that's in that building, um, it has to be vacant for three months. And that's really important because if you, and like I do, you know, patience is not one of my strong points. You know, if you would want to go forwards and actually go, I'll go with, it's only two months, but I know it's been two months vacant. Prior approval will be rejected on those properties. Um, but yeah, some of the commercial failures that have been on the high street are prime sort of pickings for this. And it's not prime pickings just for the opportunity. It's prime pickings to actually help that community in that area sort of regenerate. And again, we can go into that at a later date. But um, we're not um, able to do all areas. So areas of outstanding natural beauty, you can't do sort of, you know, there's no permitted developments and it's new rules and the 1st of August doesn't come into that. But one of the most crucial areas that does fall in, which wasn't here before, was that you're actually able to do this within conservation areas now. Now, conservation areas, when I was you know, looking into it in the past, sounds like wooded areas and all that. Well, the central of London, you know, massive conser conservation areas, massive in um, lots of the cities around the country. So that is a major area where now that falls into permitted development and you don't have to go through that time exhaustion of planning if PD can be done for you. So that's a massive change. And um, yeah, you know, there's there's lots of other areas which I'm sure you can question me about, Sean, but I think that's enough for the, the audience at the moment for layman's terms. Bravo, I want to applaud. I might, uh, I might just, I might just mute and go out. I, uh, <laughs> come back in half an hour. Great work. I'll let you catch your breath. In, I mean, you've sort of touched on it there. In that, it sounds like these are big changes that are potentially going to have a big impact on the market. Um, dangerous making assumptions. But I'm going to assume you agree that they're big changes. What do you view them as? positive or negative and how do you weigh up any positive or negative impacts from these changes that come into force? As a lender who can lend on these types of refurbishment properties, so here at Glenhawk, you know, I see that as a positive for the developers out there. So I think it's a massive positive for developers. If you were to ask somebody in some of the local authorities, I think they would see it as a negative because they will have a lack of control over the housing stock and the stock in and the commercial stock and actually the changing of the high street. So um, but I will I will get off the fence and say that I think it's a really good um, change. I think it's a really good positive change for developers. I think it'll have a massive effect on the high street in particular, um, with the decimation, as I said, of some of the biggest brands that allow developers to revitalise the high streets. I think there's actually something else on that. So we're just thinking about maybe the Debenhams and you know and all those areas. But what's actually happened? And you know we've got three hundred thousand um, target each year the government have, which they fail to hit a lot of the times of new housing stock but actually with the new housing stock you start building in greenfield and brownfield sites and all the different areas but that's pushing them out of town centers and these secondary and tertiary sort of locations the ones where i've really you know and the little town centers are the ones that are probably going to be looked after by this rule itself i believe it gives a really good opportunity for those areas in the community to expand i'm not going to move too uh, evangelical on this but I think COVID has made us actually realize that you know we like things local we like lots of supporting people local as well I definitely believe in that so if you can have houses which have been converted over out of an old commercial but next to a commercial which could be utilized that's only got to be good news for both hasn't it and actually could revitalize little town centers itself um, good opportunity is that actually for developers there's no dwelling mix restrictions so whereas the planning may restrict what you can actually do within the dwellings that you're doing then that could be it one of the negatives for developers even though is that you can't actually add on there could not be any external alterations so anything sort of an extension to those that building itself as well so there is different bits um, that you've got to learn of but again it's about understanding the rules and reading that um, GDPO document yeah and, and just on the point of town centres you're raising there you know, it, it doesn't matter whether it's the dreaded Tesco for want of, you know, for want of a better brand mm -hmm. to pluck out of the air, or whether it's actually the local business. If you think about it, the problem for some of them businesses was actually the lack of footfall in that area. So when the developments go in, which then bring 
an influx of people, whether that's because they're going there to work or whether that's because more likely they're living there, renting flats, units, whatever it be. Actually, then that's when the local businesses, small businesses, not just the Tesco going, ooh, woohoo, there's a load of people there, we'll, we'll plonk on there. It's everyone who then benefits from that. And then, like you say, it reinvigorates that area of the high street because you've brought back what it needs. And what it needs is people and footfall. Everything needs to diversify, don't they? And I think, you know, pre-COVID, we've learned that from everything that's online sales. So actually, have you got an online sales if you've got a business that's in that? Do you do that? You know, developers have had to um, diversify because of the cost of materials has gone up. So they put that in their schedule of work. You know, people are living differently. And I think, you know, the, there is a point in case of this for that actually just because the high streets always looked like that or just because we've always been able to have those commercial properties that have then had to go through planning. Why don't we make it easier? If we need more housing stock, allow developers to actually put in some really you know, really good builds that have got some really good architecture and really good plans to them and actually allow people to live in different places they may want to do in different types of buildings. You know, we've seen it in Liverpool, we've seen it in Manchester, the revitalization and the regeneration of some of those areas. It's it's amazing what can be done by developers' eye. Are there any, I'm guessing there are, but are what are the key exclusions, limitations, the key headlines on the permitted development right? I know we touched on a few of them, but just, just to put yeah. it under this umbrella. So um, it's a great question. So the building must have been vacant for a continuous period of three months immediately prior to um, the date of the prior approval application. Try and say that sentence again. You know, the use of the building must have fallen within sort of, um, you know, one of the more following classes that, you know, the E class that was in there. And one of the things that it can't be as well is that you can't have, it had to have been within that class for the last two years when I'm mentioning that. So, for example, it can't have been changed into a sort of class E or changed within class E in permitted developments within the last two years and then changed into a residential property. And I think that's fair. And then we mentioned the floor space being 1,500 square metres as well, maximum. But again, I see that as a positive, not a really a limitation because of the tenfold increase it's um, been before. So, yeah, there's a few other things that uh, need to think of regarding sort of conservation areas that you can allow, but not national parks, not the areas of outstanding beauty that we mentioned before. Uh, maybe safety safety hazard areas. Why would you want to live there anyway? You know, and military explosive areas and storage areas is one that uh, I sort of chuckled at as well. But um, yeah, agricultural tenancy is something to have a look at as well. But again, come back to me because my knowledge on that area as well is not as strong as um, some of the things I've already mentioned. And the, yeah, trust me, I I stayed well clear of anything agricultural <laughs> law school or anything like that. Yeah, so no. Yeah, and I'm a Welshman. I should be really keen for that, shouldn't I? <laughs> exactly. Um, when you were touching on the cumulative floor space, just how likely is it that that how how many situations do you see where people are actually um, doing over 1,500 cumulative floor space? Like, do you think that is that going to in, in any way shape or form put people off or have any impact you know is, no. is that a, a smaller part of the market for you no it will not put people off at all so let's break this down it doesn't mean that 1500 square feet is the only size property that now can be actually developed you know i've been writing at glenhawk lots of refurbishment deals that have got planning permission to change a commercial unit of 3000 or more you know made up numbers on that but 3000 square meters into something else it just has to come with planning so that just comes with a bit more time and a bit more uh, planning, sorry for the pun, you know, that the landlord would need to do and the developer would need to do on it. So Glenhall can assist in both ways for that. All this does, the 1,500 square metres, is just allow you the opportunity to do that in a time-efficient way. So two questions. You mentioned Article 4. So what for those that, that would want to know, um, what is Article 4? And also how do these changes impact do you think on article four directions moving forward yeah it's a good question so article four um something that's come out um and i heard about it you know back in 2015 not saying it came out then but the first time i heard about it was 2015 and i thought there was a new boy band on the market or something but however it wasn't it was something to do with planning authorities and i had to read that paper again basically it's um it gives planning authorities and you know the local areas the power to remove specified development rights locally um, so let's go back to that example again, where I had the one where I said the residential property 
that you want to convert into a HMO. Remember, house of multiple occupancy, for those who are listening, you know, eight bedrooms or more. Um, then what that allows you to do, and, you know, C4, which is HMOs, can allow you to go to six bedrooms. Now, with most local authorities, you're able to actually convert that under permitted developments. However, Article 4 stops you, allowing you to actually automatically go and go for C3 to a C4. So you have to go for planning permission. Now, there's 20% of the local authorities out there that actually have an Article 4 in there. Um, well-known ones, Southampton, um, Birmingham coming in, Salford, got them as well. But the London, if you're listening to this from London or looking to buy in London, it's got 22 boroughs that have got Article 4 there as well. So the new legislation coming in doesn't undo these Article 4s. Actually, it came in on the 1st of August. What it'll actually allow, if there's still an Article 4 area, it still will be and for this commercial to residential uh, refurbishments and conversions that will still exist till the 31st of July 2022 however the local authorities really need to get a step on if they want to extend that article 4 um, uh, powers in the sense for the planning there because um, yeah this legislation is not the new legislation to get article 4s is not so easy this is the government again wanting houses to be developed you know, and built and more housing stock on the market and the high street being changed. Yes, yeah, so on that point, that's the opportunity in a way in that high street is to convert at least part of it, hypothetically, into yeah. residential stock, whether that be flats, whether that be whatever you want to do with it. Um, and, and, and I guess some developers may well take the view, well, actually, I'll refurb the whole lot. So I've got an amazing flat, say, above the shop. Yeah in a typical yeah. high street and then maybe the office space beneath it becomes more attractive maybe even look at that as a as a, a wider project in a way for that area I, yes. I presume is that fair or that's fair yeah that that can be uh, each each deal that i have across my desk is slightly different from what someone wants to do with it whether that be mixed commercial commercial you know and it's just understanding because these pd changes are not supposed to be seen in my mind even though we're talking about them you know something that's separate and new pds existed Planning's changed. It's just an opening up. And that actually just opens up what you can scope that you can do with bridging. It still comes down to the point of that you'd still need to know about what you're doing through a schedule of works, showing us what you want to do with that property, understanding what you're purchasing it for, understanding what the costs are going to be for doing that, and understanding what the gross development value will be. We can lend up to, up to with one of our products, 75% of that LTGDB, loan to gross de uh, development value, um, and yeah, that, that's how we can help you at Glenhall. There's nothing to be concerned about. Whatever mix of property that you want to do with that commercial, we can assist you with. And how does a commercial um, deal with Glenhawk work in terms of funding that refurbishment or something like that? What, what's, what's the kind of journey like? Well, uh, the journey's really good, you know, and a really good service on it. Um, it's what we would value that at, which some of our lenders won't do, is that we'll do that on a vacant possession, um, the GDV value. And if it's one of these deals that we're talking about specifically, you want it to be vacant possession because it needs to be, um, you know, tenants out of there for three months anyway. So it would actually just be about understanding the experience of the customers, understanding exactly what their A&L position is, what their cash position is, understanding about the security itself and knowing what the plans would be of that property, that we would be able to get you terms on that and actually then out into sort of underwriting. The underwriting process as well as then the legals can run side by side at the same time to minimise the time that you've got there. And then we can put that on, um, you know, we can loan up to 100% of the works on them we can loan up to 75% of the GDV of that property as well. So we can actually give you all of those um, costs in um, in arrears. And then, you know, it completes. Uh, and then completes, you can have up to a 12 or 18 month term on that. And you can have the amount of draws that you need to do, drawdowns, during the um, term of the loan. And actually, you know, pay interest on them when you draw them down as well. So a very slick operation that we've got here that can help you out with these refurbishment deals. Now, I wish that I had planned my, you know, new refurbishment products and all those ones that are coming out to hand time come in on the 1st of August right by this. But they've been in for a few months now, um, some really uh, good changes to them. And this just shows the next opportunity for the developers. How, how big a pull is the 100% 
works is that just like an element or is that how big a pull is that out of interest for people it's 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 a it's a big um draw for um developers because again as long as they've done their calculations with it why would they want to put their liquidity in it when they could be lending off the uh, gdv so actually by lending off the up um what the value of the property is going to be uplifted to then you know that's a massive draw for them to keep that liquid position and then, you know there's lots of other areas that then we can help you out with later on developers always want to be in a liquid position when they finish that build they may actually come back to another bridge to do a marketing exit loan on a completed uh, bridge as well to go on to that next commercial development so you'll find a lot of repeat customers using us for that and who do you think will benefit um, most from the reforms and changes to permitted development rights in the coming years um i think everybody i think society will they, that's that's a big answer isn't it but i so think it's much I th- wider than just your property developers or 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 the bigger operations that are out there you know hoover and up huge asset portfolios if you will this, yeah. this is something you think's more for the society if you will rather than either the big players or the small players in the market if I was going to go, you know, I did a case the other day, and if it was like a um, commercial property, you know, for terms that came in under these new, this new scheme, and, you know, there's ex-commercial property flat um, offices that they want to turn into 36 um, flats. Now, this wasn't a big, you know, conglomerate doing this. This was a developer, but the developer did have experience of doing that deal. So I'd go in with the eyes wide open and not think this is my first deal. Lots of people build up experience and do what's called like tart and turns. Sorry for the phrase, but the buy to let, do a bit of work on it and flip it. And they'll get more comfortable with their crack team around them of who they can actually do to do that. So this is this is at the benefit of the developers. Of course it is. Is it at the developer uh, um, of the market itself? Yes, because, you know, if they are not done up to spec and not done right, then the tenants won't go and actually live in them if it is tenants that way. So actually it's a benefit of the tenants actually having really good stock that they can actually go and live in closer to work, closer to their family, wherever it may be, closer to the shops in the city centre. So I think it benefits society as a whole. Absolutely fantastic. And uh, permitted development rights, absolute superstar on that. Jamie, well done. Thank you so much. Um, no that's it for this week, everyone. Thank you, James, for being such a fantastic guest. And thank you for listening. If you want any further information on Glenhawk and their products, please check out the website and the links below. I'd seriously recommend following Jamie on LinkedIn and, and communicating with him on there. He's, he's fantastic at engaging with you directly. Please share and spread the word about the show. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please hit us with a five-star review. But more importantly, please stay well and take care.